I want to do a series called Follow Me, uh, just looking at the life of Jesus and his words and saying, how can we as a church glean from Jesus? And as you know, I love Jesus. He's, he's just amazing. He is. Every time, I, every time I look at his life, I'm like, wow, there's so much more. There's so much more for me to become. And God says for each one of us, right, that we can we will move from glory to glory. We'll become more and more like him. So I mean, one, I think, wow, there's so much more about him. And there's so much more that we can do. Like Jesus did awesome things, and, and he invites us into that. So every time we look at the life of Jesus, I just want to encourage you guys to think about that way. Uh, how is this challenging me to be more like you? How is this encouraging me to continue in what I'm doing, you know, even in the face of trial or persecution? And how does it inspire you? How does it just make you go, wow, wow, you're awesome. And uh, as we continue to do that, I believe we'll be continually transformed more and more into his image. And our lives and our church and our fellowship will all look like him. This morning we're going to be in the book of John. And this is a, a good story of Jesus that, was, that is quoted here in John and also in the other Gospels. And there's some different variances, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. But uh, how many of you grew up in a home that had untouchables? Does anybody have untouchables? <laughs> now, there's a few Latin, they do. Oh yeah, I remember the moment my mom... Oh, when, I, when I touch the untouchable, right? They got the China, the China cabinet, or the, the what do they call it? Uh, a a carol cabinet, right? With the little little trinkets in it. Um, mom, we had we had five kids in the house, and so mom was smart. She didn't have a lot of untouchables, you know. But she did have. She used to have bunnies. I don't know if I told you this about the ceramic bunnies. She still has them. If you go into her. And I don't know, are they still on the kitchen table? I think, I think they might be, but they were untouchables and they were on the kitchen table and uh, I broke the bunny ear. So I, that, was, I, that was a story, that was a story. But today as we look at John chapter 2, we see Jesus talk about some untouchables to him. Like, like I know you know mom is a, you know, a sweet, loving individual full of compassion. But mom has some untouchables and some law-breaking rules that we couldn't do in the house. I remember as a kid, one of the things mom did to kind of let us know that we needed to get ourselves in check. We had a rice paddle that was often used as a form of discipline, a rod of correction. And so whenever we got a little too close to the untouchables and to the rules, the rice paddle was always, it was in this little, um, they, this little you know, container with all your kitchen, and it would go from there to there on the countertop, and we knew. That's it. All right, that's it, right? That's it. Yesterday, it was really fun with with Denver. You know, I, uh, we we don't use a rod of correction at the house. Um, you guys know that I, I, he does running and different responses when there is correction needed. And so yesterday we were at the soccer game and. And Denver decided that he was going to be a little extra goofy out on the soccer field and just, you know, like, just pushing the edge a little bit. And so I told him, my sign, I, I, I had him come over to me at one point, I said, hey buddy, you know, I know you're having fun, you're playing with your, your friends, but you know, you came out here to learn soccer, let's, let's enjoy the soccer game. And I said, if you see me stand up, you need to come over here. <laughs> So I had to stand up twice, and he came over each time. It was good, but then at the end of the game, at the end of the game, uh, one of the parents came up to me and was talking to me, and I didn't feel I was sitting down, and they were standing up, so I didn't feel right sitting down. There, so I just I stood up, and I started. And we were talking, and then about a minute later, Denver comes running. I'm sorry, Dad. Do we have to go now? I told him if I stand up one more time, we would have to. <laughs> and so he came to me. Dad, do we have to go? I said, Oh, I'm sorry, Denver. I love you. you can Go play the game. I was just talking. I forgot. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus here in John chapter 2, he, he comes into the temple, and I believe it, it, it gives us a little insight into some untouchables. Something Jesus just wasn't right with people touching and messing with. And so, John chapter 2. Starting in verse 13, we're going to read this passage and we're going to see Jesus' response. We're going to see what he did, why he did what he did. And I believe it's going to, again, encourage us to continue to follow after him. John chapter 2, verse 13, it says this. 
The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling, selling pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remember that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you will rise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Good, powerful scripture. Even a reminder here at the end that the disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed in his scripture. But we've been going over and over again, saying this over and over again, that, man, I... We've got to be a people of the word, knowing the word, because then all of a sudden when things came to pass, it encouraged them, it increased their faith. They believed because they remembered this moment. I want to encourage you guys, be in the word, because when this stuff starts happening, then be like, it's true, it's good, I believe it now because I see what... Well, we're talking about healing, and I'm like, I was just looking to another guy that preached last night again about healing, and I was just getting excited because his dad uh, turned to him when he was a young PK, a pastor's kid, and he said, um, you know, if you believe God can do miracles at a young age of 10 years old, then you need to start praying for people for miracles. And so then he started, the, my friend, his name is John Mark. Uh, I might have him come speak next year. But anyway, John Mark, and he said, at 10 years old, I just started praying for people because, man, if I believe that there's miracles, and then when he started seeing the miracles and God answered for it, he was like, yeah, I believe it even more. Yeah. I want to encourage you guys, know the Word of God, believe it, start acting it out, and it, and it will confirm in you the truth of His words. That's not even part of my message, but it's just an encouragement to you guys. Believe these things, read these things, know these things, and as you live it out, you go, yeah. Sing a song, Waymaker, and then you leave God on it, and he, he makes the way, and he does a miracle, and you're like, yeah, I know. And then, then with gusto, you can sing with everybody on Sunday morning, and you're like, yes, Waymaker, clear go, because you know it, and you believe it, right? Yeah. Just encouraging me, guys, just encouraging so we do have here this story of Jesus clearing the temple. For those of us that have been maybe in the church for a while or, or have read in the scripture, we know that there are other, uh, other moments or another story when Jesus clears the temple. But as I'm studying this and I'm finding out, and, and some people ask, you know, is this the same one? So Jesus clears the temple in, all, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also here in John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke records a clearing of the temple. And just to inform you a little bit, that clearing of the temple is at the end of Jesus' ministry. Because before, it's before he's going to the cross. He goes, they go back to the temple, and again, they find merchants, and they find people selling things in the temple, taking advantage of people in the temple, and Jesus clears the temple, and in, and in that moment, he makes a very strong statement, and he clears the temple, and he says that uh, my house shall be ha called the house of prayer for all nations. And in that instance, specifically, they're talking about all, all nations. That's a, that is a spot, that, that, is a, uh, that is a spot where those who are outside the Jewish lineage, they could come and they could worship and have and have a time with the Lord and time in His presence, and that was meant for them. And, and in that space, they were doing the same thing they were doing here in John chapter 2. They were selling things, they were making it a market, and, the, and it was meant for, it was ordained for people to come and to worship God that were outside the Jewish culture, outside the Jewish nation. And so that was, that was a, another untouchable, but that there is a separate occasion to this first initial occasion in John chapter 2, where Jesus comes to the temple. This is actually at the beginning of his ministry. So there's two 
two instances of clearing the temple that Jesus talked about. And this morning, we want to focus here on John chapter 2. It's at the beginning of his ministry. And I believe, why do I focus, why do I want to make the emphasis? Because, man, at the beginning of things and at the end of things, people say really important things, right? At the if it, it, and especially if it happens at the beginning and the end of Jesus' ministry, I believe maybe it's, it's an important thing to examine. What is Jesus getting across here at this moment? And here specifically, Jesus starts clearing the temple. And he says, what? Start in, in verse 16. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His temple was not a place of trade. It was not a place for merchants. It was a place of worship. His temple was a place of worship. This gathering is a place of worship. A place to come before the Lord. A place to meet with the Lord. A place to sing of his goodness. It's a place to receive from his this is the place for worship. And Jesus, talking about his untouchables, Jesus is passionate about worship of the Father. Don't mess with worship. Don't get it wrong. We're going to look at some scriptures. We're going to reinforce that. Jesus is passionate about the Father receiving the worship he deserves. We see this as a, as a mark, as a thread through the whole scripture. Starting in the, in the Ten Commandments. Very early on. Don't put anything above God. Don't worship any graven image. Don't do, keep the Sabbath day holy. Passionate about worship. Going to protect it. And we see here, just like Mama getting that thing out, me standing up. Jesus was passionate, but he was serious about, he gets a cord of, uh, sorry, a whip of cords. Yeah. I said, I mean, Mama means business when the paddle comes out, right? Jesus meant business when the whip comes out. He's like, I'm going to make a statement here that this is about the Father's house. Yeah. It's not about merchandise. What causes Jesus to get so, it, so passionate? Tell myself, I'm not angry, I'm not mad, I'm just I'm a little passionate right now about the way you behave. <laughs> Jesus, get a little passionate, get a little angry, to have a little force behind his behavior. Why? People selling things. What, what is this? Jesus, they're selling things. Why is the selling of items? So negative in this fact. We can look at one aspect of this passage, and maybe a familiar thing that we've heard before. That they were not just selling things, but they were taking advantage of people, right? They were, they were, they we know that the exchange rate was higher. Man, people were getting rich off others trying to come and worship the Father. And so this, it's wrong. Let's, let's set things straight, right? Jesus coming in, I'm setting things straight. It's wrong what you're doing. You're taking advantage of people. They're coming here to worship my Father, and you're going to charge them extra prices. You're going to charge them a greater exchange rate. You're going to think, and all those facts are true. Man, the, the priests in the time, they were, they were getting wealthy off of other people trying to worship the Father. People were traveling to come, and they get there, and all of a sudden, man, taking advantage of people. God is passionate about you and about me. You know what? He's passionate about protecting those who are weak and vulnerable. Amen. Just, he, he, his heart is for those that are downtrodden. He is near to the broken heart. Right? He is one that protects the weak. If you look at the Ten Commandments, every one of them is a protection of the weak, a protection of the vulnerable. Do not kill. I'm, I'm glad that one is written. Uh, God values my life. <laughs> God values my He said, don't kill, don't take a man. Don't steal, don't cover other people. Don't, right? don't lie. Don't take advantage of the weak. Don't try to manipulate. Don't do these things. 
God, in, from the beginning, sets up His commands so that it is, it is to protect the, in His character throughout the whole Old Testament and the whole New Testament. Think about the, the gospel story. What is the gospel story? He's protecting those. He's, he's providing for those who cannot do it on their own. Yeah. Right? The gospel story is, I cannot live the perfect life that God has asked me to live. So Jesus, His Son, lived the life I couldn't. He did it for me. It is protection of the weak. It is protection of the vulnerable. It is for those who are brokenhearted, who are unable. And so we see here, it, I, think, I think that definitely vibes in on part of Jesus' untouchable. He said, hey, you're taking advantage of the people that are coming here to worship me. Flip the coin tables over. Get all these animals out of here. But I don't think just talking about that aspect, trade, takes, uh, takes to the heart of Jesus' untouchable. Remember, he's passionate about the worship of the Father. Do, and specifically, verse 16, it says, Do not make my Father's house. You say this place? And then, the, my Father's house. What was the temple designed for? It was a place of worship. It's a place of forgiveness. <coughs> It was a place of restoration. It was a place of protection. It was a, it was a place where the Spirit of God dwelled and sat. It was, it was a answered prayer. It was, it was a place to meet with God. The temple was a meeting place of God. And in John chapter 4, we're going to go through that on this series, but in John chapter 4, he's got the Jesus says this. this God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. With a fully submitted heart, you goes on in the teaching of this series, we'll go, they said, you cannot serve two masters, right? He's a, in the Old Testament, the Psalms, he's a jealous God. Like, he wants it all. He wants our whole heart in submission to him. And I look at this and I see about what was prescribed for the people to come and how they were supposed to come and worship. And part of what is happening here in the temple by the money changers and providing these, these animals for sacrifice is that they were taking advantage of the people, but they weren't just taking advantage of the people, they were taking advantage of the people's disobedience. Because there was a way, a proper way, to worship. This morning, I'm not going to go through all of Exodus and Leviticus and go over all of the Old Testament ways in which they were supposed to worship. But they were taking advantage of their disobedience and they were deceiving people because the people thought they were doing was right by coming to the temple to present their sacrifice to the Lord, but they weren't following the proper instruction of worship. Guys, I forgot the meaning and I love it this morning. First Samuel chapter 15. Verse 22. The first Samuel, they're talking about worship, sacrifice. That God is pleased with burnt offering. And if you if you don't fully understand, in the Old Testament there was a there is a burnt uh, there is burnt offering. There is a sacrifice. Was the sacrifices were uh, in were intertwined into the proper worship of the Lord when. When women gave birth, there was a certain offering that they had to give, that they, they, they were required to give to the Lord as a blessing. God, thank you for the child. And they bless. There was a certain offering, sin offering. There were certain times of the year there was offering brought to the Lord. There, there were certain things, and they would bring them, and they would bring them to the Lord as a sacrifice. And just as we 
give to the Lord right now in our finances and our tithe and our offering. We're giving to the Lord. We're, we're sacrificing. But Jesus was the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the purity of all people. And so once and for all, right in Hebrews, once and for all, we no longer have to offer these sacrifices. But in 1 Samuel 15, 22, there's an important aspect Oh, for us this morning and for these, uh, for the people offering the sacrifice, it says this in verse 22. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So we had all these people, they were traveling to the temple, they wanted to offer, they wanted to do what was right. They wanted to make the sacrifice. They wanted to make the burnt offering. They wanted to go before the Lord. They were going before the Lord. And they were. They said, "It became a, no, it became a matter of convenience rather than obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience, submission, a submitted heart, a submitted heart to the Lord God. Yes, Lord, whatever your way is the best way, whatever you say, God, I submit my own. obedience to His way is better than performing the right act. A submitted heart to the Father is better than showing up every Sunday at church. It's better than a perfect attendance in your reading law. It's better than attending every once a month prayer that we have as a church. Amen. It's better that we be obedient in all those things. We have a submitted heart in all. But obedience is better than the sacrifice. How does it apply here? What's going on here at the temple? Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. It was a requirement that the people would bring a lamb, bring a sacrifice, bring a whatever, their burnt offering from their own flock. From their own possession. From what they had. And if they didn't have what was needed, then they were to join with the neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't have what I needed to this, for this sacrifice. Will you join with me and we'll do it together? And the sale at the temple became like a convenient shop rather than an act of submission and obedience to the Father. I'll go to the temple, they have what I need. I'll get by. I'll, I'll do this, but it won't be completely what I have. I'll, I'll go to the temple, and, and it'll be convenient for me to get, the, get what I need there and sacrifice to the Lord. I don't have to be fully submitted to what the Father has asked me to do with his proper worship. It was a matter of convenience rather than obedience. I always think about this in my life. Man, what have I turned a convenience rather than obedience? Oh, I could just get by with this. Man, Jesus, Jesus is going to get a quart of whips. What, what kind of things do he need to overturn in my life? Where I've, I've turned things into what, what's convenient, what's easy for me. How can I coast through this with the Lord? How can I just get by? How can I just come to the church and I got my attendance? How can I just get my gold star because I read all my passages for the week? How can I just get by? How? Instead of obedience, submission. All right, there's a difference. There's a difference when, I'm, when you're raising a child. I love all these examples of raising children now, because I got all these now. This is good, right? Raising a child is the difference between when they when they submit to your your, your instructions and when they do when they do it, right? <laughs> I have to correct. No, never. You can you can walk back. Go do that again, right? Like that was not in the right. That was not in the right heart. That was not in the right way. That was that was a little bit. Yeah. Come in. <laughs> And Jesus shows up and he said, nope, you kind of got it. You got it, though. 
You kind of got it, but nope. Try again. Try again. And that's not that, that, that what was instructed. That is not how you worship my father. That is not what my house is about. My house, the, the word for it's not about convenience. You got it wrong. Try again. Try again. Why? Well, because how, how do we, Pastor, how do we, how do we see this in the scripture? I mean, Jesus over and over again is talking about die to yourself. Worship me, verse 4, chapter 4. Worship me in spirit and in truth. It is hey, submitted fully in obedience. They were getting it wrong. Jesus is passionate about that. Don't touch worship. Don't get it wrong. Don't try to play it. Don't try to fake it. I tell them wrong. Don't fake it. No, we can start over again. Don't thank you, guys. He says, I desire a true heart of obedience. Let's move on in the scripture. His disciples, again, they were people of the word. They, were, they, they knew the Old Testament. They knew the word. And in verse 17, he said, the disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was passionate. Worshiping the Father rightly. Holy Spirit. But it continues on showing another area. Reminder. Verse 18, the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. I love Jesus' prophetic words. And already, man, this is what's going to happen. You're going to kill me. And in three days, I'm going to raise. And he's just laying it out for them, right? Woo! Yes! Praise the Lord. Prophetic word. Man, love Jesus, prophesy, foreshadowing, maybe if we use a nice little normal word. But no, it's prophetic. It's just Jesus is foretelling his death and his resurrection right there at the beginning of his ministry. Again, he's pointing to the fact that he's going to finish it all. He's going to complete the work. The Jews said to him, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you rise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus, what did the temple represent? The temple was a place, right, of his presence, of God's presence. It was a place of worship, it was a place of reverence, it was a place of sacrifice where the, the sins of the people would be forgiven. A place where God's presence dwelled. And in the, in the, in the temple there was a, a priestly family, a, priest, a train of priestly families, and the, and the priestly families would be the ones, that would be like the go-between between the common folk, me, you guys too, we're all common folk, right? We're, it would be the go between between the people and the presence of God was the priest. Mm -hmm. The priest would go and they would take sacrifices, they would go and they would cleanse the, the people of their sin, right? It was those beautiful ceremonies. So much foreshadowed, it's really awesome to read and to study out the temple and all those things, how it foreshadows us and, 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 and Jesus. And it's beautiful. But, Jesus says, you can, you're going to destroy this temple in three days. I'll rise it up. The one is he is prophesying about his own life. He'll be destroyed. And he'll be raised up. But the second one is this reality that we now live in as a New Testament belief. That the temple of God no longer is bound that geographical location. Three days, and we rise up. But how can you do that? Because there's so many stones, and it took so much things, and it took all this. No, Jesus himself rose again, 
And he is the temple. He is the go-between. He is, in Hebrews right chapter 9, he is now the temple of God. He holds it. He is the go-between. He, he is the high priest, right? He is. So he prophesied, you guys won't need this physical building anymore. The Jews, to the Jewish people, that was, that was really hard for them to receive. You guys are we're not going to need this building, this thing, that we, this cabin, this beautiful place. We don't need this anymore. I mean, that's like blasphemy. You're like, what are you talking about, right? But Jesus was speaking to them. I am the temple. I am the go-between. I am the one that goes before the Lord and represents you on behalf of yourself. I am that. This morning to us, this morning, again, he speaks. I am that go-between. The good news of the gospel is once we were separated from the presence of God, and in that moment of sacrifice when Jesus raised his last breath, and the veil that separated the very presence of God from the common from the people was torn, and the blood of the Lamb that was perfect and once and for all was applied to our life. And now in the Hebrews, if you read the whole book of Hebrews, Power. Now I can go before the Lord. I can go before God. Jesus is temple. He's the goat. He's how we access the Father. First Corinthians. How is this possible? Again, it goes back to that good news that Jesus was destroyed, and three days later, he rose again, allowing us now to contain the presence of God. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is now what? Dwelling in us. In us. So one, we can rejoice in that. Mm -hmm. I get excited about that. Yes, I can meet with God wherever we are. Now I'm in this physical location. Man, I I've, I've, um, know more about this building than I ever had before. The drywall and the you know insulation. I've, I've done the wiring. I've done a lot of things on this building now. And it's just a building, guys. It's nothing special about this. You know what's special about it is when we gather together. We could gather together in the community building. We could gather together in the bar like they're doing this afternoon at 4 o'clock to have a church. Why? Because Jesus' body was destroyed, and three days later, he rose up. And now, wherever we are, the presence of God is with us, the Spirit of God is with us. And when we gather together, whether it's under a tree in the middle of an African country, or, or whether it's in a building, or whether it's, it's on a ship uh, out in the ocean, whether it's on a riverside, whether it's in a fancy crystal building out in San Diego, California, or just a plain old building here in Madison, Wisconsin. Church. We can sing praise to his name when the presence of God comes. We can worship him. That's exciting for us, right? And it, uh, like I said, right, some things in this, in this uh, series is going to challenge us, it's going to encourage us, it's going to inspire us. I think that's a, one of those moments of inspiration. But as we are in awe of this moment that the Holy Spirit is in us, and the presence of God is in us, and we are the temple of God, and wherever we are, we can worship Him, it's amazing. We can't forget the picture of Jesus with a cord of whips. The temple is a place of holiness. High priest got something wrong. They used to tie, they had to tie a rope to his ankle with a bell on it just to make sure he didn't die in the presence of God. It's 
really, man, this, this series, I'm like, man, I really want to stay on the awe moment. Like, oh, wow, man. But it challenges me every time I look at the life of Jesus. Every time I look at this story, every time I look at what he says, it challenges me. And I don't want to leave us every, every Sunday at a challenging moment, but I'm sorry, it's going to happen again, right? That's why I come down here and try to make it softer. I'm like, identify. It. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not just up here. I'm just speaking to me too. Okay? That's why I'm coming down here. Just... God was, Jesus expressed his passion about the worship for his Father. Getting rid of the, the money changers, getting rid of the convenience of it, getting rid of it, get it out. Doesn't belong in the house of God. If you're going to come and worship the Father, you're going to worship Him the way He asks you to. And for us this morning, as much as we're in awe of the fact and the wonderfulness that the presence of God is now living in us, we are the holy temple of the Lord. Amen. I'm just, I'm just thinking, God, what Jesus, what things? You need to get out of my life. Because it doesn't represent your holiness. <laughs> Jesus, this is part of the first part of his ministry. Is, I'm going to clear, clear the temple. You guys, you guys aren't being obedient. You think you're submitting. You're doing the right thing. You're acting kind of right. You kind of got it. It looks right. It almost looks right. It almost gets it. But your heart Jesus, is not a is not completely obedient. It's not an act of sacrifice. That lamb, that, that is not coming from you. You're not giving up anything. Yeah. This morning, again, he asked us. He wants us. Check yourself. What acts of sacrifice are you doing without a heart of submission, of obedience to the Father? Yes, Father. Whatever you have, whatever you ask of me, yes, sir. Yes, Father. No short. There's no shortcuts. No shortcuts to dying. It's dying requires dying. Dying requires final work. Dying requires final breath. Right? I'm not making sense. Yeah, you're asking me to make sacrifice. You're asking me for obedience. That's why I want to leave this message today. What area is somebody that I just made? Oh, it's more convenient that I do this. It's a little convenient if I just come in. It's still convenient if I come every so often. It's just a, it's. More convenient if I don't worship you in this way. I take this shortcut in my life. And so sometimes, I, sometimes we talk about Jesus be the way maker. We got ourselves in the mess, and God's like, God, if you would have just did the obedient thing, you took the convenient route, and you just did the obedient thing, you wouldn't have got yourself in the mess. Is that right? God's so gracious that even if we got ourselves in the mess, we still want to clean it up for us. Yes. That's still who he is. He's still his character, right? Mm -hmm. We're not just dealing with the Holy Spirit here with us, right? I'm going to stop talking. The Holy Spirit. Let me pray over us as we respond. And it's the question I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. <coughs> ask Jesus. Jesus, what area in my life do you need to bring a whip of cords and clear out? You can act in that way. What area do you need to clean out? What area am I trying to make something convenient when you're asking me to be obedient to you? And I believe as he reveals that, he only reveals something because he wants to take us out of it. He wants, to, he wants us to be overcomers, right? He wants us to be victorious. He wants us to receive from him. Okay, that's why he did it. He said, it's not, you're not doing it right, so you're missing out. You're missing out. Okay, I don't want us to miss out. Let me pray over you. And then the Holy, I want to pray that the Holy Spirit comes, speaks to us, we hear Him, and we respond in obedience the way God asks us.
Father, we are grateful for your word this morning. Father, I thank you that you are a true Father. God, that you are full of love. Father, part of your love brings correction, it brings training, God. Your word is useful, God, for, for right living. It's useful for rebuke. So Holy Spirit, I, I ask that you would speak now to your people. God, that our ears would be open to hear your still, small voice this morning, pointing out the areas of our lives that we have leaned towards convenience rather than obedience. Jesus, we ask now, would you show us the area in our life that you want to clear up, that you want to correct? Lord, in repentance, Father, may we ask for forgiveness, that you would come and strengthen, that you would come and repair, God, that you would come and bring what you desire for us, for our full communion with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus.